Uh, this time I'll turn the meeting back over to Dr. Wetz and we'll hear from Western Piedmont College and their uh, legislative meeting. Hopefully, I don't put you to sleep. <laughs> I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Brennan, uh, and thank you to the county commissioners, uh, the staff, folks here for all of your support for Western Piedmont Community College. Uh, and Mr. Blackwell, great to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much for your support of our college uh, and our community in Raleigh. Uh, really. Uh, the college can't operate without being an integral part of our community and having the support of all of you in our community. And coming in from out of the area, it is really exciting to me to see the level of support, the love for the college, and the amount of integration, partnership, and work that we have here. We are an excellent community. We have a great college and we have that because of partnerships and working together and the support that we have in our town. And we can't do it without you. So I really start there thinking. We can't go any further than that. Uh, got a few things I want to just kind of give you an update on and touch on. Uh, the impacts from this year of uh, the college have been incredible. Uh, and in the time that I've been here, we've jumped in to accomplish uh, some, some things that get us moving as we look to the future. And one of the things that I've said to the college is we do not want to do pre-pandemic better. What we want to do is post-pandemic extremely well. <clears throat> What's that going to look like? How's that going to be? Because it's different. And so we started this year working on our strategic plan. And the first thing that I have up here is our vision statement and our mission statement that were adopted by our board. And the chair of our board, Scott, sitting here, our vice chair, Amy, um, one of the things that attracted me to Western Piedmont was that we had a great board, great people that are, care about the college. And we can't do what we do without their support and without the board's support. And so back at uh, our April meeting, they adopted our vision and mission statement. Western Piedmont Community College is a transformational community leader that empowers all individuals to achieve success. That's our vision. That's who we are. Everybody in our community, all segments of our community, empowering people to achieve success. Uh, that means that we're working with them. And we want to be a transformational community leader. Economic development, uh, economic mobility. Lifting people up, giving people pathways to education that they don't have. That's all pulled in to our vision, who we want to be. And then our mission, which is what we do, Western Piedmont Community College unites with all people in our community to identify and achieve their goals through an innovative, high-quality educational experience. We create, and we are going to create, amazing student experiences. And you take who we are and what we do, and we want to be an integral, strong part, contributor in our community that is moving us forward, moving our community forward, providing opportunities for our residents and people in our county that they don't have in other places. And that's a vision and a mission that is driving everything that we really are talking about. Everything that we get is being founded based and driven from our vision and our mission statement. So as you look through this, uh, I've got some things that I want to just kind of give you a little bit of a picture of uh, the impact that we've had. I could have this morning brought in awesome things uh, for Western Piedmont Community College. We, and I'm going to touch on a few things. Uh, but I want to touch on and really give you a little bit of a picture uh, of a challenge that we faced. And I'm going to hit on this as we get into our agenda. Um, but it's really been the impact that we've seen from the pandemic this past year. Uh, I can tell you that on the state performance indicators, we're pretty much the only college in the state, five out of the six, we're at the top. We're better than most. 
uh, faculty and staff, great uh, team that we've got. But when you look at this slide, what you will see is the impact that the pandemic had on us on enrollment, uh, which it drives our funding, drives our FTE. And when you look at this, this is just showing our curriculum side. Uh, and when you look at that, our total enrollment from fall 20, 19 fall to 20 fall dropped about 8%. Spring, we dropped about 13.4% spring to spring. Uh, and if you look at that, um, we spring as a percentage of fall, and I don't want to get into all the numbers because I don't want to bore you with this, but if you just look at the picture, uh, what I want you to see is we were having a pretty good impact, and what you did see is the impact of the pandemic. Uh, it impacted us on our college and career pathways. It impacted us on our birth middle college. Uh, and our traditional enrollment. Every single one of those was impacted. On our continuing ed side, uh, our impact with correctional officers, uh, our impact with emergency training, our impact with doing basic skills, adult high school in the prisons, all of that was stopped this past year. So our FTE, uh, which is full-time equivalency, which drives our funding, significantly impacted going forward. Um, and I, as we look at this uh, to show you kind of what some of the impacts are, this represents, the blue line there represents applications. Our applications dropped significantly during the pandemic. Uh, and what we found as we worked with the school district is just the number of students who decided they weren't going anywhere. And I'll show you a, a survey here in just a minute uh, of the impact on that. If you look down at the bottom, our percentage of applicants actually registering, coming to us, stayed about the same. We did pretty well getting the folks who applied in, but in our community, across the state, and across the country, the impact on community colleges was significant. The impact of the pandemic on the people that we serve was incredibly significant. The universities did not have the same impact that the community colleges did. And a lot of that has to do with the population that we serve. We generally serve lower income students. We generally serve people who have a significantly more challenges than folks who go to the university. Our students needed more help and assistance. Uh, so if you look at this, I, I wish we were unique in some ways, but what this shows is a national survey in public two-year college enrollment across the country dropped almost 10 percent that's the second line that you've got there um, from your left universities had about a two percent drop uh, this is not what anybody predicted going into this everybody was predicting that universities would have a significant impact and community colleges would go up but university students did not come to the community college they either went to the university or they stayed home. They did not transition over, which is what almost everybody in the reading and research thought they were going to do. So if you look at all of those lines, I'm not going to read all this to you, but significant impact across the board, freshmen, <coughs> continuing students, uh, continuing enrollment from high school, this is what we saw across the entire country. If you look at North Carolina, uh, it ranged from the far west was about, down about 1% in enrollment. Our area down about 5%. Uh, you had some places on the coast down 6%. Uh, and then kind of off the coast, down on the southern border, they were down about 7%. This is on average uh, across the state. The state overall was down about 5% for community colleges. Uh, these are real impacts on people. Community colleges are the driver for developing a workforce and economic development. This is a concerning sign for our region and the state when we're not pulling enough people to feed our workforce and our economic development. And so I wanted to show you, give you a picture here of overall how the state and what the nation has looked like. And then finally, just to give you one more picture, this was a survey uh, of the national. And when it says 20% um, of community college students expected to delay their graduation because of COVID. 
20%. Uh, dealing with the pandemic, we just had a whole bunch of people basically say, hey, we're going to stop, we're going to pause, because it's just too much to try to go to college and deal with all of this at the same time. So it, when you think about that, 20%, one out of five students saying, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to delay my graduation to get through the pandemic. Those are our students. And that's what we've seen at Western Piedmont Community College. Student after student, as we talk to them, it's just too much to try to take on right now. Uh, we saw high school students trying to take dual enrollment classes significantly impacted. Our students need assistance to survive and develop through this pandemic. Uh, and this is something that is going to carry forward. Uh, what we also see because of what's going on in the secondary school system is we are getting students and we are going to get students over the next three to five years who are underprepared, not ready for college. They've been in remote learning for a year. It's going to be over a year. And they're struggling. So we have to be prepared to serve the students we have. We have to be prepared to reach out. We can't just say, well, I want different students. These are the students we have. And we're going to do an excellent job serving the students we have. So I wanted to give you just a real quick um, picture through that. And so what I asked today is, I've got a couple of students, great students, by the way, Jasmine Rowland sitting here and No Lopez. Uh, and I asked them to give you just a couple of minutes. Both of these students are on track to graduate in May. Uh, Jasmine is a social science student looking to transfer to Western Carolina, uh, physical therapy. Uh, no is in our medical lab assistant program, working in the lab. He has dealt with COVID uh, since the beginning <laughs> uh, while going to school. Both of these students are on track to graduate in May. But I wanted you to hear from a couple of students about what it's been like through the pandemic and a couple of students that have navigated to get through because it's tough. So Jasmine, I'll ask you to come up first and just uh, talk a little, a couple of minutes about what you think. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Jasmine. Um, well, I wanted to start off uh, talking about my early transition from seated classes to online classes. Um, I've never taken an online class before, uh, the impacts of COVID on Western people. Um, so it was very challenging um, trying to transition from that, but I was uh, thankfully reassured by my teachers that we're all on the same page. Um, mistakes are going to be made, but uh, we're going to get through this together, and that was very reassuring. Um, uh, in early 2020, I was working part-time, but I felt that it was in my best interest to um, put my job to uh, better protect my family and for mental health reasons as well. Um, I did have disability services that were um, provided to me by Western Piedmont to, um, before COVID that I carried with me into uh, the um, transition to the COVID uh, guidelines. Um, that those were very helpful. So, um, for example, I was able to get extensions on assignments if necessary and excused absences. Um, and I wanted to touch on my experience with instructor-student communication as well. Um, I think that was probably my biggest challenge, but I also, at the same time, received incredible support from my instructors. Anything that I needed, my instructor would go beyond what I asked and help me get on the right track. And I felt a genuine appreciation for their hard work and my hard work, and I was very reassured by that. Um, I did receive financial support from Western Piedmont Community College, from Hill Grants, various scholarships that I have listed, and HEERF emergency care funds to students that I used for, um, to carry me throughout um, Western Piedmont and for personal expenses like medical bills and medicine. Um, so overall, I did so despite the circumstances. I'm very grateful to have been part of an institution that cares so much about their students genuinely. Um, I'm great, very grateful to be safe and healthy, and um, I stand with those who have been affected by this pandemic, and we're very grateful to be a part of this event, too. Thank you so much.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Noel Lopez, and I'm currently in the Medical Laboratory Technology Program at Western Piedmont Community College. Uh, I am a current resident of Hickory, but about two years ago, I decided to continue and finally complete my educational journey in Morganton. Uh, when I first arrived at the campus, I was immediately impressed by all the nice land and how well it is maintained by all the staff, and that uh, that shows what pride they take in the school. Um, I also quickly learned that Western Piedmont makes their students a top priority. Um, a variety of resources are always available to all students at any given time, especially right now, even during the pandemic. Um, student services can range from something as routine as tutoring or more confidential matters um, like financial assistance or counseling. Um, I didn't receive any financial assistance, but it wasn't the community college's fault. I'm a doctor recipient, so I'm not allowed to receive any financial assistance. Um, the instructors are also wonderful. As can be, this is especially true of my MLT instructor, Mrs. Uh, Beverly Berry, uh, who always takes time out of their busy schedules to pass down their knowledge and hopes that one day uh, their students become a valuable member of the healthcare, healthcare system. Um, as we all know, COVID has been relentless, but WPCC has demonstrated formidable resilience in the face of danger uh, while keeping all their students uh, and faculty safe. Uh, I understand that changes might not have been easy, but overall, I am quite impressed by how Western Piedmont has handled the situation. Uh, I wholeheartedly enjoyed my experience at WPCC. Uh, when graduation comes, uh, know that I will forever be grateful for the wonderful opportunity this school has given to me. Uh, this short summary is by no means all that is wonderful about WPCC, and I hope that all future students see just how important the community college truly is to the community of Morganton. Uh, while not being one of the biggest or most populated community colleges in North Carolina, you can trust me when I tell you that any person of any background or in any situation wanting to further their education will be well received and above all, given the necessary tools to succeed in all future endeavors at Western Piedmont Community College. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. And, uh, I said to you earlier, we don't get to choose our students, and that's very true. But if we did have a draft or a choice, these would be two that we drafted very early in the process but to have at the college. And, and I hope you picked up uh, on some of the challenges that they talked about, because they've taken those challenges head on, whether it's financial, trying to navigate the working, not being able to work, the financial implications of that, I love when Jasmine says she's never taken an online class. And last March, we said, guess what? You get to take all online classes. That's a challenge. Both of these faced that head on and have been able to move through. A lot of our students, it was too much for them. And they're not sitting here today. And that's why you're seeing that enrollment and why I started with that. I want you to realize we have students that are being successful, but we have a lot. There are struggling. And I also wanted you to hear this morning uh, from one of our faculty who went through this transition with us. Rusty's a, a faculty member in our psychology area, uh, has been with the college, and he went through the transition. And I wanted you to hear from a faculty member the other side of this equation as to what it's been like going through. So, Rusty, come on. Thank you, Dr. Welch, and thank you, too, as well. Um, you kind of hit on some of, the, some of the things I want to talk about, too. Um, I'm a psychology teacher. I've been here for 16 years, and uh, prior to that, I worked as a psychologist in the field for about 12 years, and uh, in human services for five years before that, so getting old. Um, I am a first generation college graduate. Uh, my family, I don't come from an educated family, and the process of becoming educated was very transformative for me. Uh, my life is richer and broader 
and more texture than I could have ever imagined prior to going to college. And the mechanism for that change was not uh, books or tests or uh, even teachers. It was um, deep conversations about important topics. And I had those conversations with instructors and with other uh, students. And so I knew when I became an instructor that what I needed to do was to uh, create or facilitate a culture where those conversations happen. And I think I did a really good job of that uh, in CD classes. Um, they were very dynamic. Online classes, on the other hand, I was not really into those. Uh, they seemed kind of sterile and impersonal, imper impersonal and uh, uh, I wasn't crazy about doing it. So in comes the COVID epidemic and all classes go online. So I had sort of an existential crisis there. Um, a big part of my identity is what I do here. And uh, so I knew I needed to make some very profound changes in my online classes. So I ran out and bought a GoPro video camera and I got some video editing software. You've done some of this. Uh, and I also got uh, uh, software to do animation. So if you've seen those uh, videos that have the hand drawing things on a whiteboard, uh, I learned how to do that. So my goal was to uh, create an educational catalog of videos that would take the place of my uh, lectures in class. And uh, the learning curve on video editing, I don't know who else has done that, but it's really steep. It's a difficult process. And I spent hundreds of hours working on videos. I came in uh, on my own dime last summer and I'm off the clock and uh, worked on the project and the outcome was really good. Um, what I found was that the videos inspired the same kind of conversations as I was getting in my CD classes. Uh, the conversations were in discussion boards online rather than uh, in person, but they happened. And another side effect was that I had students uh, coming up to me in the community introducing themselves because they knew me from the video. Uh, they didn't know me before. Um, I also found that students were sharing the videos with their parents. So I'm super happy with that. In the fall, I started teaching synchronous classes, which is the Zoom uh, thing. And uh, so it had an online component, and then we met for basically Zoom meetings. And I wasn't excited about that. I, my experience with the Zoom thing had always been a lot of technical issues. Um, I was surprised to find that teaching synchronous classes for me was about as close to the seated classes as you can get. Uh, the exact same vibe, the exact same um, sort of dynamic environment can happen in a Zoom meeting as, as in a CD class. Fast forward to this semester, I'm taking a class from Yale University called the Science of Well-Being. And it's basically uh, psychological research on happiness and what makes a happy life. So I'm gonna incorporate those things into my courses. I'm also gonna steal some of Yale University's online strategies and hope to pitch a positive psychology course for less than a few months in the future. That's what I've been doing over the past year. I'm not unique. I am one of a huge pool of passionate, uh, dedicated faculty. And I'm so proud to be a part of what Western Piedmont is doing. And I thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you. Rusty, let me ask you real quick. Yeah. Who paid for the GoPro? I did. Who, who paid you for the hours you came in last summer? I, I want I, I want to emphasize that. He he mentioned he is a special faculty person. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but he is not unique in a lot of ways. We have faculty that in the transition, things were moving so fast. Uh, and initially the college didn't have any of that in their budget. We had faculty buying hardware, software, 
to serve students on their own dime. Now, with her money coming in, we want the college, we don't want our faculty to have to spend their own money. We want the college to provide those resources. But to do that and offer a really excellent online type class, you got to have video. And we have faculty across the board, and, and I can echo because I've done it too, Rusty. If you have not gotten involved in video editing and now you're trying to learn it, it is a massive, steep, quick curve. And we have faculty working to pick that up. We have some resources at the college to be able to provide some support like that. But when you're making that transition as quickly as we did, you can't hit every single faculty member, much less all of the adjuncts that are teaching classes part time. Uh, so it was an incredible challenge. We met that challenge because of excellent faculty. And we had students who faced those challenges in their own lives and were able to be successful. But we've got to continue to improve and to get better going forward because we're not gonna go back to just do pre-pandemic better. We're gonna do post-pandemic excellent. Uh, as we look to the future with this, uh, we're working with uh, other community colleges around us to be more regional in our approach. We share a couple of uh, employees with Catawba Valley. Uh, community college, looking to be as efficient as we can be. We're looking at additional partnerships. I'm talking to McDowell and Isothermal right now about how we could maybe put in place uh, a center for teaching and learning that we share because none of us have the resources to actually drive that as the really large colleges do, but if we can partner together on it, we can make it happen. Uh, we're also looking to what serves our community. And that's our regional trades center. Uh, really focusing in uh, into entrepreneurship and construction and the things that are needed uh, as we look to the future. We are in the middle of our strategic planning, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier. And we're building this off of the four asking pillars, which are related to what excellent community colleges do. Access and success. You saw the enrollment earlier. We have to get more students in. Not growing is not an option. It's just not. Because if we're not serving our community, we're not doing our job. We have to provide opportunities for people to have economic mobility. So access and success. Learning outcomes. I've used this illustration so much, I know some people are getting tired. But if it doesn't, it doesn't do us any good to turn out a welding student or a medical lab technology student who goes to work if we send no out when he graduates in May and he goes to the lab and he can't do anything, what well, good? Learning outcomes, we, he's, he's got to learn something to be successful afterwards. And then completion and transfer. It doesn't do us any good to bring in a thousand students in the fall if 950 of them fail. They've got to complete. We've got to provide the support and the resources to get them through. And then finally, we are responsible for post-graduation outcomes. Jasmine's planning to go to Western Carolina. If she goes to Western Carolina and fails because we didn't give her the right foundation and background to be successful, we have. You're going to be fine. That's on us. Uh, and I will tell you what I'm extremely proud of is we know that our transfer students perform as well or slightly better than the students who start at the university. We track that data. Uh, but we're responsible for the post-graduation outcomes. What kind of jobs are they getting? We want to make sure that no, not only gets a job, he has an opportunity for career advancement. We want him to be able to move on. So these four pillars are driving our strategic plan. Uh, we're in the middle of that process. So I'd love to be able to show you that. We're not done with it yet. Uh, we're meeting with the college. We've had a bunch of focus groups in the fall. Uh, we're working through that process. That's going to drive this future look. It's going to support our regional construction trade center. It's going to support our regional partnerships. And it's going to support our commitment to economic development, our continuing ed, and developing a workforce that will support Burke County and the region, which is what we're working for. Um, these are some of the partnerships. Uh, and this is just a few. I just threw a few up here. I did want to point out Appalachian State and Leeds McRae specifically. Uh, we're going here in just a few weeks to sign an articulation agreement with Appalachian State University for Aspire Appalachian. 
uh, which will give our students uh, a really great start for transferring to Appalachian State. Uh, and we're signing at the same time an articulation agreement with Lise McCray. So we're working with multiple universities to make the transition for our students easy. Western, uh, Western Carolina is also on our list to, to go. We don't have that quite set yet, but uh, I'm working that side too. And we're going to be able to add uh, an official agreement with them, hopefully this coming year too. Uh, so those are just some of the things that we're going on. Work in Burke, our Pioneer Preview. And we'll be doing that this year. Right now scheduled for a drive-through event. Hopefully, uh, with vaccines and everything, uh, as we look at numbers, we're going to be able to let people get out of their cars uh, and actually participate. We didn't do Pioneer Preview last year. That's one of the reasons that you see our enrollment uh, where it is. Uh, because we, we weren't able to do our normal recruiting. We're not able to do normal recruiting this year, but we're, we're adapting uh, to this. So come Monday, March 29th, uh, if you want to take a class, we start registration. So let your friends, your family, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, whoever you got know, Monday, we'd like to see people in Western Piedmont Community College and signing up. The college also works really hard uh, to bring in funding. Uh, these are just, uh, this isn't an extensive list. Uh, it's, these, these are most of the grants that we bring in. Uh, this year, we were really proud to be selected for the Student Success Services Grant, 1.2 million, uh, which will uh, allow us to serve students that are struggling. Uh, we're really focused into uh, our minority, underrepresented, lower socioeconomic status students, which are the students that struggle uh, the most. Uh, we were able to get an ARC, which is the Appalachian Region Council, 100000 for a heavy equipment operator simulator. You can see down in that little picture there. Uh, this will allow us to bring uh, anyone in and put them on a simulator to learn how to operate heavy equipment. Uh, really excited about that. That will be part of our regional construction trades uh, program as we go forward. You know, we're working apprenticeships. Uh, took a group down to Forsyth Tech. Uh, just this uh, earlier this week on Monday to look at the apprenticeship program that I had helped set up before I came here. Uh, I was uh, feeling pretty good a little bit because I sat down and they showed their recruiting video and he started with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I started to tell them they had to take me off and I'm not recruiting for Forsyth anymore. But, uh, but they did. And they played the video and uh, Joel's on the video <laughs> recruiting for Forsyth Tech. So, uh, Kind of felt a little weird to be honest, but a great program. I had a couple of really good folks. I, I, I take credit for it, but I had some great folks who really did a lot of work. Uh, we're going to replicate some of that here at Western Piedmont to build our apprenticeship program, uh, and we've got some grants to help uh, really work with that. So, just wanted to get a little picture. I'm not reading all of these, but uh, just to kind of show you a little bit about how uh, we're operating and funding that we bring in uh, through this. Um, and then I want to talk to you about our challenges. So you, you've heard from students, you've heard from a faculty member, uh, which are the important uh, folks here at the college. Uh, I just get to be here to represent the college across the board, but these are the folks that matter. Our students, our faculty, and our staff. But if you look at this, you've heard what Rusty said about what our faculty, our employees did. Over the past 10 years, our faculty and staff basically have gotten 13% as a total increase in their salaries about 1.3% per year. Not really even matching inflation. They've gotten 0% the last two years. Uh, we, this year, actually did a bonus out of some of our performance-based funding. Uh, so we took money out of our budget um, to be able to do a bonus. But that's not a recurring deal. Uh, but our faculty and staff worked incredibly hard prior to the pandemic, and extremely hard through the pandemic to make this happen. Uh, they unequivocally deserve a raise. Uh, state employees got a raise. Uh, the last couple of years, we're behind. Uh, our salaries rank behind UNC faculty and our K-12 faculty. When you look at salaries for our faculty, they're behind the university system and the K-12 system. In my opinion, that's, that's really not acceptable. The community college is integral and located in every community across the state. And I believe we're essential for Burke County. Absolutely believe it. I've been in community colleges now 20-something years. I didn't go to a community college. I went to a, 
I wouldn't say a traditional, I went to a military college, which was a little weird, but I'm weird, so that's okay. Wasn't well, quite traditional, but I went to a traditional four-year college. I knew nothing about community college. Took out loans, could have saved a whole lot of money if I had gone to the local community college. We're the best option for most people. And our faculty and our staff deserve to be recognized for that. They do an incredible job. We rank 40th in the nation for public two-year faculty salaries. 40. We have the number one community college system in the country. Western Piedmont Community College is recognized as a great college in that system. And I say to you, unequivocally, we're number one. Because if you go to California, California will tell you they're number one, but they'll say, well, North Carolina is probably number two. You go to Texas, they'll tell you they're number one. But North Carolina is probably number two. Go around the country, everybody thinks they're the best, but they all think we're right up there. We, we are the best. Not even a question. We do a great job. But we're not, we're not quite honestly funded as the best community college in the country. And that's who we are. During the past two years, 31% of our faculty applicants, 33%, basically one out of three applicants, turn us down in the south. I could give you a lot of specifics, but I, I'll touch really quickly. Uh, we had, uh, for an assistant controller, I think it was 13 applications. Uh, four of those applicants dropped out due to salary. Uh, we offered one uh, who just couldn't accept the salary. It was an actually a state employee. Uh, we've lost maintenance workers to state agencies. Uh, we've lost people to the city. We lose people to uh, other state jobs, not even talking about private industry, to other state agencies because our salaries are not competitive there. Um, we do lose to private industry. Um, we are a state agency. I, I would love for us to pay the same as private industry. I don't think that's um, the way it works. Uh, I think we're, we need to be efficient. We need to be very careful with uh, our states and our county's money. Um, but we ought to at least be in the ballpark. And we lose folks on a regular basis. One out of three. Uh, we are on our registrar. Our registrar's position, uh, and this one bothers me, I'll be honest with you. We had a person interested from West Virginia. Really wanted to come. In a similar position in West Virginia. Actually, this would have been a little bit of a step up. That person was already making $20,000 more than what we could pay. West Virginia. He turned us down. Wouldn't come. Can't blame him. But that's, that's where we are. Uh, and I will tell you that we looked at the salaries of the colleges around us just to see if we were completely out of line. And we're not. So we've been working through. We're on our fourth round now. Fourth round, we've been turned down by Two others, uh, one from a, a private college turned us down, a uh, salary. Uh, another one we recruited out of private industry. Um, that person wanted to come to private industry, actually went back and offered them more money to keep them. Um, and we couldn't match what the private industry then was willing to pay them to keep them. This is a real challenge that we're facing across the board. So we talk a lot about faculty salaries, but both of the examples I just gave you are staff. Because faculty and staff track. So while faculty, we know the data, we're 40th in the country, we're not far off of that probably on staff. That, that data's not tracked quite the same way. This is a challenge for us because we need the best people at Western Piedmont Community College. And let's be honest, if you don't pay, you don't get the best. Unless there's a personal connection uh, or something that's out there. It's, it's the challenge that we face. Um, the other thing that we're facing here, and when you look at our legislative priorities, uh, you and I have talked about this, that salary is our number one priority by far. I just believe that our people deserve it and need it, uh, and I see the challenges that we're facing every day. But I started with the enrollment because um, that's going to impact us in the way we're funded in North Carolina. And so one of the things that we're asking for, and you've got in your packet, I'm not reading all the exact numbers to you, but we're asking... Uh, for some budget stabilization funds. Uh, enrollment impacts are real.
Social distancing is real, and I've got another slide I'll show you in just a minute uh, of how we've had to change the mix of our classes and what that impact is. But everything from increased technology requirements, GoPros, video, microphones, um, we bought laptops for students who didn't have them. We bought hotspots. We're doing everything we can to try to provide uh, resources for students and faculty and staff to be able to meet the needs. Restrictions on recruiting. Uh, you all came through our health screening this morning. We do that on campus, uh, trying to keep people safe. By the way, um, it may change tomorrow, but as of yesterday, uh, we've not had a positive case in our faculty staff since January 20th. Uh, so uh, we're, we're watching our measures, we're doing things that we can uh, to keep everybody safe. And uh, that's one of the reasons we do the health screening, social distancing in classes. Um, Sandy and her team have been working with a consultant. We've been upgrading purifying in our air handling system uh, so that we can purify our air. Our system is fairly old uh, and we want to be able to draw in more fresh air, put in systems. So we've been working to, to do things around that, all increased expenses. Uh, and a lot of that, we've been able to pull some of the federal HER funds down uh, to work with some of that. But as we look forward, all of these increased costs, <coughs> even though our enrollment's gone down, are going to be existing over the next couple of years. And then I mentioned to you earlier, we know we're going to be dealing with students who are coming to us less prepared, which they're going to require additional resources uh, as we go forward. So that budget stabilization uh, is really important to us. If you look at this, I'll just point out quickly, um, should be to, to your left, that blue bar, the blue circle there, that was how many face-to-face -face classes we offered in fall of 19. In fall of 20, due to the pandemic, you can see the slice of the pie that we did face-to-face. -face. Western Piedmont never shut down. We have had students, faculty and staff on campus except for maybe just a few weeks in April or so um, before I got here, uh, every college kind of went remote for just a little while as we were adapting. But outside of that, we've had people on campus 100% of the time. We have never shut down. We've offered face-to-face -face classes. We've done hands-on instruction, uh, served people. We've been open the entire time. We have never shut down. Uh, and so as you look, we're going back, just not quite as much of the face-to-face that we've got out there. We are having to adjust. And then finally, cybersecurity, modern IT system, uh, system office and what we deal with that we have to use. System is outdated. It is extremely expensive uh, and we're asking for funding uh, to really drive that. And then cybersecurity. Eight community colleges have already been compromised. Um, we do the best we can. Uh, I will say that it's somewhat the luck of the draw that hasn't been us. Um, we, we try to operate conservatively. But just to show you, this represents the attacks that we experienced. This is a two-week window. Uh, and you probably can't quite see it, but if you look at the left, um, virus is blocked. That is, on March 14th, 20 million on that day. 20 million. We on average, when you include multimedia, we are attacked about a billion times a day. B, B, billion. That's a two week window. We are at risk with student data, employee data, all the financial aid things that come through. Um, it is a thing that keeps me up. So when we talk about cybersecurity, uh, we talk about having a modern system. Uh, <clears throat> this is what we're dealing with. Uh, and this, by the way, really act, actually only represents what our firewall is dealing with. We actually have other measures in place too. Uh, we're doing constant uh, training, phishing protection. Um, we send emails out that are not real, trying to get people to click on them uh, as we do training. But this is a real threat that we're dealing with. Um, and then the last thing, uh, the, as we talk about uh, any type of bond, capital funding, uh, we have multiple buildings that are more than 30 years old, five that are more than 50 years old. Uh, our regional trade center, we've got uh, some future phases. We want to be included uh, in any capital bond uh, that the state puts out there. 
Uh, buildings F and J, uh, we really need to renovate significantly. Uh, if you get Sandy off to the side when she's really honest, she'll tell you we really need to bring a bulldozer in one night and remove them and build them back. Uh, they, they're really uh, there. But we definitely need a significant renovation uh, to represent. Uh, and we're really working through. We're real close on our funding for our construction trades. Um, homes Urban keeps getting rescheduled, but we feel pretty good. Uh, I won't tell until I actually get the check, I think. But uh, with that, the county support, uh, we're going after a Golden Leaf grant. We're going after some art funding uh, to deal with that. So we're really pulling pretty hard. Uh, the county is supporting us with a million dollars. We'll bring in um, between Homes Urban, Art Grant, Golden Leaf, we should bring in another three or four million. And then the North Carolina Connect Bonds is funding part of that also. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. And then, you know, we're raising, we're going to be raising money for things like the regional trade centers, student support. People will give to those things, but there's a lot of infrastructure repairs and renovations. People don't get as excited about those things when you raise money. But they're real things, whether it's a water system, electrical system, HVAC. Uh, these are things that we need to stay on top of as we move forward. And the county has done a fantastic job uh, supporting us. We obviously want to see that continue. But as we look across with that bond, we definitely want to be uh, included with that. So thank you for your time. I, I know in, in a lot of ways I'm talking to the choir because uh, we see so much great support here. Um, but I really appreciate that, and I'll stop there. And are there any questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Joel, I, I think you touched on a little bit on uh, maybe on the trades, uh, especially building and whatever. And the high schools are already doing that. Are we working somehow with the high schools on the building trades? Well, yes, sir. Uh, as a joint thing, I guess they're, they're building live projects. I think they were building live projects, uh, both high schools which they sold and made money on. So are we working together with them? We are. And what we hope to do is expand our dual enrollment program with what they're doing. Um, so we, we are working with them uh, through, we've got a Burke Partners in Education, uh, looking at our dual enrollment program, how do we become a resource uh, for them? Uh, and then how are they a resource for us? Not just recruiting, uh, whether it's building, uh, we do a lot of work with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, building wall panels with them. We want to be able to increase that work uh, and then really working closely uh, with the school district and the two high schools that build. They do a great job with their live projects. And uh, so hopefully we're going to be able to partner on that going forward. Uh, we've been in a building, uh, we didn't have restrooms in the lab that we were currently using. That, that's what we're using. The building is 70 years old. Um, very hard to recruit students. Uh, you just have to be honest about where we are. We need something that shows a little sizzle and shows what the career can be like. Uh, and so as we do that, we're going to be open to the school district and partnering with them and on their sites working together. I, I guess all the trades, because there, there's such a shortage of every, every kind of trade, plumber, electrician. Plumbing, electrician, <coughs> building, uh, masonry, carpentry uh, will be our base, electrician. Uh, and then we'll add from there. Heavy equipment operator, which I mentioned earlier, we're already doing some things with that. Uh, so we'll, we will expand out from that as we as we need to. Thank you. Uh, as Maynard has mentioned in several conversations with him, uh, surveying something that can be hard to find. We, we've got plans, but we will start with what our base is, which is carpentry, plumbing, uh, and electrical will be the big base that we're looking to start with uh, to recruit folks into. Good, thank you. Yes, sir. Regarding the NC Connect bond money, can you remind me of how much uh, West Piedmont got out of the bond? How much of that has been submitted and how much is still available? Sandy, I don't know the number. I don't know how much we got left, but I don't know the first number. Um, and I'm going to round off the number. We got $5.9 million. We've got uh, two projects a renovation for our digital effects and animation that's ongoing right now. That's $750,000 is committed to that. And we're probably 40 to 50 percent completed with that project. The rest of the bond money, which is 1.2 million, 1.1, 1.2 million, will be for the trades building. And that money is committed to the trades building, but we have not started it yet. And we're still waiting for the closing of Homes Urban and the uh, information from Golden League on whether we get any money from that grant. But we hope to start 
um, at least getting the architect and contractor on board uh, before summer and then hopefully get the design phase before the file. You said the rest of the money was 1.2, 1.2 and three quarters doesn't add up to 5.9. What, what happened to the other three quarters? So with the, the first part of the money that we used, we renovated the H building on our main campus, which is for Burke Middle College now. We moved the dental facilities to this building in the two classrooms uh, on the other side of the hall and renovated the complete H building since it was older, um, replaced the roof on that building. And, and every part of that building was renovated from the restrooms to the uh, distance learning classes that Burke Middle College uses in connection with the School for Science and Math. That was the biggest part. Uh, we also did some sidewalk repair and some other minor uh, renovation projects. But essentially that other money has already been spent and around two million between the two you mentioned is what's left unexpended. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Welch, remind me, we had uh, some discussion on this when we had our one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, but how many instructional classes does Western Piedmont Community College offer that uh, community colleges in other counties do not offer that we would have that group of people to attract regardless whether they lived in this county or neighboring counties? But how many of those exclusive classes are available at Western Piedmont? Uh, some of the building construction is, is us regionally, the carpentry part. Um, Caldwell is doing some of that on the CE side, um, but uh, that'll be really what we're offering. Um, the electrical is another one that, um, there's some electrical programs, but the full electrician program that we're putting in and the full build the construction program, we're the only ones that are doing that. Um, masonry, I think we're the only ones that have that running. Uh, plumbing kind of depends on where you look. So in some of these, the colleges have a little bit of that on the books, but they're not actually running anything with it. Uh, HVAC is one that is offered in a couple of different places. So, um, but it's pretty small. We're not seeing, we're not meeting the need at HVAC. So building construction is the, Full building construction associate degree and the full electrical are ones that would be us. And the second question I had was what's your break even point? How many students do you have to have going to school every year to, to where you're not going in the hole? So about per class or the college overall? Both. Um, uh, the, the college overall, we, we adjust based on how many how many students we've got. We're um, uh, our budget is based, we had about 2,000 students fall of 19, uh, which is, is probably a good base for us. Uh, per class, it depends on the class. If you have a very heavy contact hour class, you, you need a few more uh, students to balance out. Uh, we can break even, uh, depending on the class, anywhere in the seven to eight range. Uh, I actually have a spreadsheet by class that calculates our FTE funding versus instructor cost. Uh, across the board and uh, it depends on whether it's a full-time instructor part-time instructor but uh, a seven or eight is a good number for me personally I work with 10 or 11 if I have 10 or 11 students in a class uh, I'm doing pretty well uh, and then there are some classes we break even in the five or six range so seven or eight gives us a good number uh, to work off of as we look just for the record we do have classes uh, for example nursing uh, we run pretty large classes we still lose money on nursing uh, because of the way our funding model is set up, but nursing is critical to our community. So some of our technical programs, we lose money. Some of our transfer programs, we make money. We have a higher student count. Uh, so we have to balance that out across the entire college uh, because we've got to turn out, even in some majors that are expensive, we have to turn out those students for our community. Uh, so we balance that. So if you look at our arts and sciences classes, I really want to see 20 to 25 students um, because that's where I'm making money. Uh, and then in building construction, I'd love to see seven or eight, and ideally I'd like to see 10 or 12. But if you get to the seven or eight range, you know, you're pretty much breaking even on most of our classes. Well, I know the pandemic has been tough for some, but it's been so good for other classes of people. And I, I've got a grandson who uh, Toyota paid for probably 50% of his education 
but the guy makes $25 an hour. That's $52,000 a year. Yep. And we need, we need schools like Western Piedmont teaching those because, you know, uh, getting a good mechanic to work on your car is getting about like getting a good surveyor to survey your land. Um, you know, it'll be about six months before I can get there. So, but anyhow, I, I appreciate that. And I think uh, as we, as you look to the far, and I think getting those uh, schools and training that other colleges are not uh, uh, having uh, yet pays a good good salary at the end of the day. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, would would help us help your firm grow in attendance uh, in a good way. Absolutely, and no, as he mentioned, he no um, when, when I talked, I even came to Western Piedmont because of medical lab. Technician, that's a program that didn't exist uh, there. So he is here because that's a program that we have. Last thing I'll leave you with, unless there are any other questions, and that is students who come to the community college are much more likely to stay in the community. Even those who go off to university, if we can get them through the community college, we can keep them in our community contributing to our community. And that's a really important thing, and I think community college is important here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Mr. Brennan, I'll turn it back over to you. That was a great presentation, uh, Dr. Welch. Um, you know, when as speaking for trustees, my uh, fellow trustee, Vice Chair Amy, um, you can see how proud we are of the job that West Virginia Community College has done. Uh, we're all, we've always been proud of it, especially during this pandemic. And as uh, I'll speak for the trustees as well, when we have trustee meetings, we love because we've got the best staff, I, I, you know, the community college, I know I'm biased, but they do a tremendous job. Um, we've got great, not great faculty, and we obviously love hearing from folks like Rusty who dedicated their lives um, uh, to to the community college and made it what it is. But what we really say laser focused on, you know, we talk about buildings and grounds and personnel and budget, but what we've got to stay laser focused on is the students. Jasmine, Noah, you, you know, you do as proud as trustees. Um, hearing these success stories inspires us because, you know, when we get into these meetings, some of them will be rather long, but if we get to hear from uh, student success like both of you, it inspires us to keep going. So thank you for uh, making that contribution today.